because I've had multiple addictions and was the worst by far. What's your plan for the housing recession that's going to happen within one to five years? He is very intelligent, but he's been wrong so much. They know how to manipulate your emotions to get you destroyed. But the pleb doesn't really understand that. What's up lads? We're back again. And what I got for you guys today is an AMA. So it's based on a lot of the questions that I was asked on Instagram, based on some of the questions that I was asked on the SRB Speaks TikTok as well. I got asked a couple of questions as well in the new Telegram that's up. It's the Stephen Ronald Bell Telegram. It's just an announcement channel, but you can talk in there as well in some of the topics that I cover. A lot of it are just audio notes and things like that through the day about a bunch of, I would say, random facts and life lessons. But also there's a focus on crypto as well. I'm commenting on my take on the market currently and where I see things going. I think in some of the older videos, you would see that I effectively called the bottom on Bitcoin. I was 10% off the bottom, 10 or 15% off the bottom. I sold Ethereum 20% off the top. I sold at 38.50. I televised the call when I was selling millions of dollars worth of ETH. And yeah, I effectively bought back with an average at about 1,400, 12 to 1,400 for my whole bag and then kept a couple of them for free, like free profit. And now I'm essentially gonna ride it from there. If it did dip down back down to that price, I would consider buying more. But <clears throat> for my take is that the market has bottomed, obviously on a macro level. I wasn't one of those spastics telling you guys that we're heading into some global depression or you know some great recession. I said that there would be a recession in the Euro and the, they've changed the technicality of the recession, but it's very obvious that people don't have a lot of money here. Like it's, they're struggling, but as a rule, I called the top on oil within, I would say, about 10%. I said that we would eventually see oil back at $40 a barrel. The speds, again, don't understand that that's inevitable. Like, oil is not scarce. It's not like some fucking scarce commodity. It's not like gold or Bitcoin. You know, once the bottleneck with the war and things like that eventually end, and, you know, the Saudis can only cut production for so long. Like, once that bottleneck and the war itself ends, the oil will crater again. Like it will just go back to where it was. It will range between 40 and $80 again for a very, very long time. Speds think that it's normal for oil to be $120 a barrel. And it's just not like since the Kuwait war or the Iraqi war, it's not really a thing. It only happens during times of bottleneck and, and war essentially, because they can constrict the supply and it fucks the whole logistics up. So it costs more and it's harder to distribute. So yeah, basically, you have to get in that channel and understand my market calls for the macro. I'm not one of those guys that tells you to buy some scam token and then you lose all your money. I'm only interested in the big picture where the market's going. I don't sit there and you know think that you can put $50 in a token and make a million dollars. Like that's crap. It's just generally yeah the macro because you know Bitcoin's the ultimate player. Wherever Bitcoin goes, then you can start to look at altcoins. I've told you once Bitcoin dominance hits 60 to 62%, then you can start looking at altcoins. A lot of you guys uh, obviously bought alts too early and some of you have bag held through this whole fucking crash. Like you the hardest thing with crypto is guys can make it in the bull run and then hold and do a full round trip back to where they started. And then they need another cycle to try and fucking get back to where they were the first time. You have to know when to time the cycles because it's a four year cycle. Contrary to again, what the speds say, it's a four year cycle. You just have to understand that. I understand that. Like I've ridden through multiple cycles. I've been in crypto since 2015, actively investing. I've known about Bitcoin since Silk Road in 2012. I knew a lot of guys that made, you know, 50 to 100M in the Silk Road time. And I've just been around it for so long. You know, I'm a big believer in cryptocurrency. I had a fund in it. You know, I managed, a, well, I was a partner in a fund of eight of us. And we managed at the peak, maybe 80 or 90 M US, 80 or 90 million US dollars. And we were getting great returns for guys, you know, so I have all the fucking receipts in that field. You know, I'm not someone who only made money on YouTube or only made money shilling links to leverage trade platforms. And a lot of those make money because their followers lose money. So they essentially get rich racking their followers, giving them a gambling addiction. It's like advertising a casino. A lot of you guys think that the YouTubers who play video game, like casino games online, you don't understand that's all paid. Like they're all paid to do it. Same as on Instagram. 
Now, I see fucking spastics don't understand that on Instagram, you can be a paid person who goes to the casino and just posts your wins. People don't understand that with the casino, because I know multiple online casino owners and they can have accounts for influencers that they set up and they can set the odds different per account. So if someone's on a hot street, they can like let them win a lot and then crank it down so they lose a ton. You know, it's there's different modes that you can set the games on for people, like per person, like whales, you can let them win to essentially give them a bigger addiction. But the average person doesn't understand that. They don't understand that when they see like, you know, YouTubers or Twitch streamers and that playing the casino games, that's all paid. Like they're paid marketing a casino. It's very hard to advertise the gambling industry online, but now they just have the people record their playing and winning and stuff like that, even if they lose. It just gives their followers a massively crippling addiction because I've had multiple addictions and gambling was the worst. By far, the hardest thing to stop is a crippling gambling addiction that I myself had. I had an addiction where I would blow like 10 or 20K a week, every single week while I was selling drugs. And I've known multiple friends of mine that had the, exactly the same thing. So yeah, the casino and the gambling, it's very toxic. It's not one that you want to get into. You'll never see, like I could easily fucking run casinos. I know two people that own a casino online and make great money. I could easily do that field. I could easily be invested in that field, but I don't like to support it because I know what it's like to have a gambling addiction. It's the worst addiction that you can have. A lot of the leverage traders and traders in general are just gamblers. Like they have a gambling addiction themselves. And I know people who made it in crypto and made millions of dollars and then they blew themselves up leverage trading. Like they did a full round trip back to zero because they got addicted to it. It's like, it is essentially gambling. Some guys can be great traders, a very small percentage of the population, but the majority lose money. Like it's not, it's designed that way. Like it goes against your human emotions to be able to trade. You're trading against algos and like computers and things like that. That don't have the same things. Like they know how to manipulate your emotions to get you destroyed. And where we are now, we're in the disbelief phase. And people think the disbelief phase is just a quick rally out and then we're back to new highs and it's not like that. Both sides get destroyed because neither side believe. Like the bulls believe don't really believe in this like spike. And the bears also don't have conviction that the spike is a real thing either. So both sides get crushed while we essentially consolidate for a long time. I told you guys last year that this year would be a consolidation year. I didn't tell you guys that the market was gonna crash a million percent, like all these so-called theorists and economic fucking retards because they don't make money investing. I made millions of dollars investing. I made predominantly most of my money on investments. You know, I'm an investor. I invest in companies too, like actually businesses, like brick and mortar companies. I invest in real estate. I made money on my own. So it's very different. You know, a lot of guys take advice from people who only got rich selling books and crap. Like that, that was their whole fucking stick, like shtick is that they got rich selling books on investing. If they were a good investor, they would have got rich on investing. Like people don't understand the quality of the information or they don't question where it comes from. They don't understand like, you know, guys like Peter Schiff and things like that, he is very intelligent, but he's been wrong so much. Like he, and this shit he's gotten wrong is monumental. Like his fund performance is trash. Euro Pacific, they've performed dog shit for the last 10 years, he runs multiple funds. They have predatory fees. Like he's fucked a lot of people over. And the worst thing about it all is he's missed all the tech boom. Like he's scared the boomers out of tech because he makes money selling precious metals. You can't, he can't make money on crypto. That's why he doesn't like it. Cause he can't run an exchange and then sell it for a premium. Cause it's not like that, it's not, it's not that product. Gold is that product. He can still make money on those cancerous fees, you know, where they have the markups. And you know, they're shipping and all those like, you know, shit that you shouldn't really need. He has all of that. So of course the gold and silver is really bullish and you know, the whole world is moving towards some caveman era because he makes most of his money on that. He can still charge high margins and still markups and things like that. But he's effectively destroyed pretty much everyone who's followed him. They've missed the whole tech fucking run. <laughs> like they're living in the fucking caveman days. They think that we're ditching electricity and running back to the candle. That's just fucking insane. Like the cars are gonna go out of business and he's bullish on the horse and cart. Like it's wild to me. I am bullish gold for the long term, but it's very obvious Bitcoin's the faster horse. 
You know, don't you want to be on the fastest horse or do you just want to be like right? Some of you guys are so against tech and so against Bitcoin that you don't even like, you won't even make money in that field. Like you'd rather just be head in the sand. You feel like, you know, there's too much of a sunken cost for you. Like you've, you can't admit you were wrong and just be like, you know, crypto is the future to a degree, like to a very large degree. Crypto is a fucking big, big market, a big industry. Crypto is still the one industry where you can have 10K. The average show can have 10K. The average fucking idiot doesn't know anything and he can still make a million dollar because he can, for a larger part, get lucky. You know, there is that, that sort of atmosphere. You're not going to get rich on gold, like pretty obvious, like gold and silver. You're not going to have, let's say I buy 100K worth of silver. You know, it's within the next five or 10 years, it's not going to be worth more than maybe like three or 400K. And that's fucking a lot. You know, silver itself, I think is a good asset. I think that it's, you know, the silver to gold ratio, I think that it will correct and it will eventually, silver will do have its time. It's just a higher beta version of gold. But I don't think that, you know, it's it's a very difficult asset to have in store. It's got issues with the paper contracts and things like that. It's not something that, you know, you can really store spot. Like I had a hundred kilos of silver and who the fuck wants to really deal with that? It was, it was fuck all what, like money's worth. You know, what was it? I think it was 100 kilos was like 50K or something. It was fuck all at the time. And the issue is you have to store that much, but when you want to sell it or trade it or things like that, it's very difficult. Like I could have this whole house full of silver and it would be like a few million dollars worth. Like who the fuck can store it? Like it, people don't really understand that. Like funds and that, they, they can't just create vaults full of silver. Like the real estate and the land and things, all and the storage and the security continues to go up in cost. But silver doesn't like it's it's been in a laggard it's an underperformer it's not something that you can really physically store it doesn't make sense it has to perform and it doesn't gold has the point but to a lesser degree because it's much smaller like it's more valuable but gold itself needs to be like 10 10k an ounce or something to really make sense for funds to store it at scale you know i know a lot of guys think that you know countries and things like that are, are hoarding gold and stuff like that but the pleb doesn't really understand that it doesn't matter what you know, the guys doing the spot markets and things like that, because the CME and all of that, they control the futures. Like the US controls the futures. So does it really matter if China's stockpiling fucking tons of gold? It's like the tail wags the dog, the futures wag the spot. See, the average pleb doesn't really understand jack shit. You know what I mean? They don't understand fucking stuff that I know. The stuff that matters, like they just read some crap on Zero Hedge and they think that they're fucking like no shit. And a lot of the stuff there is garbage. Like it's not shit that it's just to the fucking like midwit <laughs> gets pushed to. You know, it's like a, a lot of it's just theoretical crap or crap to shield gold and, and metals and things like that. And they would be taking massive amounts of fucking investments from like the metal fucking bullion dealers and things like that. I don't need to know who they're, who's funding Zero Hedge to know that they're obviously taking money from places like that. Like guys think that people don't who have an opinion online like they're doing it for free like when they're so on one side that it's for, it just happens for free like they don't understand that it's all paid no one does anything for free they're just on the opposite side but they're still not giving you the best information it's still biased my information is not biased because i'm not selling shit like i don't have anything to sell i already and no one can say that i don't have the results in that field to talk like I've a guy who had no fucking like, you know, investment education or anything like that. And I made it from zero to be worth over $10 million. Like who the fuck can tell me shit about investing? I did it all on my own. I didn't start some fucking like, you know, shit like selling information or something. You know, it's, it's all been done on my own prowess, like my own brilliance in that field. So now if I decide to teach it, like I already have all of the receipts, I've done it. But yeah, regarding the, get distracted, but the markets have been very much what I've been focusing on for the last, yeah, probably a few months. I've been away a lot. I've been traveling, I've fucking traveled to probably six countries in the last few months. I'm going to South America next week. So I've been doing a lot of shit, you know, a lot of stuff. I've been seeing a lot of the guys. I go to yeah, South America next week. After that, I've got a conference that I'll be doing here in uh, Gdansk, in Poland. Yeah, it's, it's been a good time. It's my birthday yesterday. I spent it with the crew here in Warsaw. Great bunch of guys, exceptional in many areas. And yeah, I would say that my life's pretty fucking great. You know, I saw my daughter, saw her in New Caledonia. I flew her 
grandparents and my side of the thing over, like my side of the family over and flew them over. And I think the trip was like, you know, probably 25K or 20K ish for one week that I spent with her because I flew over and over and we stayed in a five star resort and it was fucking brilliant. But that's the shit that you can do. Like, you know, once you fucking make it, like once you actually break through, you know, no one can jump on here and talk garbage. Like I notice a lot of the trolling and stuff like that. People talk shit that's ended. Because when people talk about me, like there's not really much that they can really say. Like they can only talk about shit and you'd be like, yeah, you were in prison for this. Or like, you know, you did this 10 years ago. Or like, you know, what did you do to your ex fucking eight years ago? Like, that's old. Like what the fuck are you do to me now? Like what have you done now compared to me? You know what I mean? It's not about where you come from. See, some of you guys are coming from the absolute bottom and it doesn't, that shit, you can still do that and still make it to the fucking top. You know, and it doesn't matter. People think that it's an insult to say like that you used to be a bum or, or shit like that. Or for me, they're like, oh, you were in a fucking like pretty much an army hospital, you know, in the mental area. And then I did spend time there. You know, I had a suicide attempt in 2012 and I've been to prison. I've done lots of things, you know, and then people think that it's an insult to throw that at me, but it's not about where you start. You know, that, that's what gives me the fucking like qualifications to speak because I've been places that other people haven't. You know, I, I would say with very high confidence that I've been places that no other YouTuber has been. You know, I've been to, yeah, low places, but also lived a life that, you know, guys that are on YouTube wouldn't have lived. They might LARP about it and things like that, but they haven't actually done it. They haven't come out the other side. If they've come out the other side, they're fucked. It's very rare that someone comes out of a life that I've lived and is a multimillionaire. You know, when he's exceptional at a lot of fucking fields. But that's me. And where I'm going to start with this AMA, I've got, I've got a lot of fucking good questions, actually. Some, of course, I can't answer. Some are a bit too sensitive. I try to answer most things, but if you're asking, you know, about like <laughs> tax mitigation, like too much shit, like you're asking too many things that are just going to get me in trouble. You know, like it's shit that you don't ask. Pay your taxes. You don't ask about fucking like, you know, outstanding crimes and things like that. You, you have to like, obviously you can't ask about that shit because people can get investigated for certain things. But of course I answer the best questions to the best of my ability. I'll start out with one of the ones that I got. I'm 18 and from Mexico. I'm just into trading. I've got my fitness on point. Do you have any advice? My advice for someone who's in Mexico and they're trading, and it does look like you, considering you're very young, have your fitness moving towards being on point. But what I would say is someone who's in Mexico, you know, you're a younger guy, you're still trading, so at least it's remote. I would keep trading. You don't post about, you know, you don't really elaborate if you're successful as a trader or whatever, but it's still a good thing to learn. It's a good thing to learn the markets, investing and things like that. I would move more towards crypto. If I was in Mexico, especially if I was a fucking broke boy in Mexico, I would be looking to leave. You know, I'd be looking to get where the pay is like, you know, $3 an hour to where it's $15 an hour or whatever. Like you've already multiplied your like fucking revenue, like your income. Yes, you'll have more shit to pay, but you're going to have a lot more opportunity if you get in somewhere like the States and you're going to be having more opportunity to be around better ideas and things like that than in Mexico. It doesn't say whether you're around people that are successful and things like that, but I would assume in Mexico, a lot of people aren't, you know, they aren't like very successful. I know there's a foreigner and I'm sure there are locals and things like that that are successful, but as a rule, I think that you would have a better chance in the States, it's so close. A lot of people are just jumping the border at this point. That's much of what I would do. You know, I wouldn't, obviously if I was me, I wouldn't want to be in the US. But if I was still starting out and I was 18, I would understand that I have to be around big ideas. I would look to your trading. I would look to get into something in tech, obviously. And I would look to work under a fucking mentor. I would look to work under, I'd get to the US and I'd be looking to learn under a mentor of someone who's good at whatever, something in tech that I would like to move into. You say trading, trading is good if you already have money. Obviously you need money to trade. I think trading is good to learn. You know, you can learn with like $100 trades and $50 trades and things like that. But it's very unlikely that you're going to get rich trading unless you already have money, like at least a nest egg or something to 
and also money that can be replenished because often with trading, it, the cost is losing money. Like when you're first learning, it's like poker. Like you're going to lose money when you first play, especially if you're playing against people who are very good as you level up. Like that's the cost of business. You sit down and you put your $100 or whatever you put down and you know that you're probably going to lose it because especially when you're still learning because there's going to be a lot better people at the table than you. And then as you rise up and get better and better tables, you're still going to lose for a long time. Like you might lose for a year or two to catch up. But yeah, I don't think it's a waste learning to trade, but I would, much like I said, be looking to get to the US to work under a mentor, get a high income skill. Trading can be, but trading is more of a side gig to me. You know, especially when you're first starting out, you're going to need something that can replenish that money and something that can continue to fund it, like fuel it as you learn. It's a good question. How did I meet Jules? So Jewel is Sartorial, Sartorial Shooter. I met Jewel in Dubai. You know, I'm not gonna to go too much into how I met him exactly, like exact groups and things that I met him in because it's not really my place to talk, it's not my group. But yeah, I met him in a certain group. I'll leave that to your imagination. I'm sure that you already know it, it's very well known. And we, I would say bonded before meeting, we started talking. I was in the army, he was in the army in Australia. His army career was obviously 10 times as good as mine, <laughs> but we still had something that we could bond on. We're both from Oz, we're both in the army at some point. He was in Dubai, I was going to Dubai. I'd heard guys say that we should meet, that he, they said that we would get along. And then I met him in Dubai, we went on a yacht and yeah, I would say that he's an exceptional guy. You know, he's very much someone that I consider a mentor of mine. You know, a lot of things he has taught me, a lot about, especially he's a master of, you know, social interactions and he's very strategic when he does things. Like he's a big thinker, he's very intelligent and he's, I think, a very good role model for men. He's very different to the fuck boy fucking loser stuff where everyone's like, it wants to be a PUA artist and guys want to just be like PP wet fuck boys running around, like just put their dick in anything. He's much more of a strategic guy and a long-term thinker. He's not a red pill guy, I would say. I don't believe that he really has anything in common with the red pill, which is good for me because I think a lot of that is low value. I think that a lot of that is damaged guys that don't like women because they have no results. Jewel has exceptional results. You know, that's what I think that I gel with him. You know, I've been to his house multiple times. I've seen like the life that he lives. I've seen his interactions with the people in his life that are important. He has a lot to teach. He's a very interesting guy. Every time I'm around him, I always learn something. You know, I don't sit there and ask him a zillion questions, but just sitting there and seeing how he is with people and how he lives and what he does and things like that, I would say that he has a lot of value to offer. He's very good at networking. He's very good at being the guy on the ground, despite being very successful. And a lot of people respect him and value him, especially in, you know, that specific one specific group. I uh, imagine that you know which one it is. He still has time to talk to everyone. He's not one of those guys that, and you'll see in the influencer game and things like that, they only talk to people that it's gonna further who, like, you know, it's gonna further their agenda. Jewel isn't like that. Like he's happy to talk to someone who just might be like, you know, just a normal dude and that's fine. Like just that he, he's happy to just talk to the normal guy. Like he doesn't care as much. I'm sure that he still networks and things like that. And he's still, you know, moving up himself but he has a lot more time for the man on the ground than a lot of other guys in that field or influencers and things like that. A lot of others, they only care about like, what, what can you do for me? You know, like, I don't want to talk to this guy. I might be fucking like a plumber or something. Like, what's the point? Like he can't do shit for me, but he will talk to everyone. You know, he's very approachable and he's also gives a lot of value. I had a, it was at Jules house once. He had a like little event there. There were a bunch of guys there. And then he had just gotten his car fixed or he had something done to his car. He's always customizing it. He's got the Ferrari, the Porsche, he's got all of the shit. And he had the mechanic or I'm sure he was better than a mechanic, but maybe like a fabricator or something come around. And this guy was a little bit overweight, but he wasn't like a fucking whale. 
And he said that, he just said it just off the cuff, you know, his interaction with Jewel, that Jewel has shown him that he wants to get in shape, you know, that he wants to lose weight. And since he's met Jewel, he's lost like 10 kilos or something like that. And that's just the kind of guy that Jewel is. Like he's a leader from the front. Like he, he sees shit and he helps people as well. He's not someone who might see a fat guy and like just sit there and make fun of them. He pushes them, but he gives them like feedback to change. He doesn't sit there and make fun of them and, and you know, kind of degrade them and things like that. He gives them ample feedback and he's also very direct. He's not afraid to step on people's toes. I respect that. You know, if he sees that someone is fucking up or something like that, he's not afraid to say it or call it out. I would say he has quite a lot of morals. He's got a lot of integrity. It's obvious that he was in the military because he's very good with guys. Like he's kind of like a brother and he still stays that soldier on the ground despite himself becoming exceptional. You know, I would assume that Jewel will be a massive fucking like, you know, thing that is kind of like a household name in a few years if that's really what he wants. I know that I don't think that he really like, you know, relishes or like loves the cameras and things like that like being in the too much in the public eye he still i think likes his own space but if he wants to do that then there's very little doubt in my mind that he'll be exceptional in that he's very intelligent he's very st strategic he has a lot of value and he's got a lot of morals and interests you know he's uh, a muslim now like he's uh, done like i don't know conversion i'm not an expert in that field but he's even talked to me about it. You know, I remember I asked him a couple of questions on Islam and things like that in Dubai, because I don't know shit about it. Like, I don't know anything about it. And I saw that a few of the guys had like changed religion or like, you know, took on that religion. So I didn't know shit about it, but he still has the patience and time to answer questions about it. My questions were pretty basic. Like, I don't know a lot about it, like Ramadan and stuff like that. I don't know anything about it. But yeah, he, he's someone who's a very good teacher. He's someone who you can ask questions and you know, as long as you're respectful and things like that, he always has time for people. You know, it's very much someone who's motivated me to be more like that. You know, where if it's just the guy who really is just a normal guy, I always have time for them. I have time to answer questions. You know, I've been doing this AMAs now for about nearly almost a year. You know, I don't charge people money. I just get on and talk. So, but that seeing him do much the same has motivated me to, you know, be more giving with my time and energy and things like that. And to still, cause I still want to stay that guy on the ground. I don't want to be, you know, some figure where people look to and they think that it's like, you're not who you really are. Like they sort of put you on a pedestal and think that you're fucking like Superman and that's bullshit. Like that's no one is fucking like, you know, everyone's just a person. There are no supermen running around. Like we're all mortals here. So. I never want to be someone who has fans. You know, I don't really like that concept. I don't think that guys should be fans of guys. I think that, you know, you could respect a guy and be like, he, he's a great guy and, and I'm learning a lot from him, but you shouldn't like, you know, be trying to suck another dude's balls. Like that's pretty fucking gay to me. So yeah, just much how I met him through that uh, certain establishment, which is a great one. You know, guys, I'm a big advocate of guys being in groups where they can meet men of that tier. You know, I think that it's getting going to be a lot harder. You know, someone like Jewel, if you aren't in groups like that, if you aren't like, you know, you don't know him already, it would be extremely hard to get to know someone like that now. Even, you know, obviously the Tates are a different level. Like, you, you, <laughs> unless you're in that specific group and you fucking like, you know, have spent time with them and things like that, it would be hard to talk to them because they're astronomical now, like they don't have enough time and it's hard for them to vet new people and things like that because obviously new people that come in could just be coming in to try and fuck them over. I think that the more public of a figure you are and the more that you have to lose, you have to be more careful with people. You know, there are people who just want to try and make a name off doing hit jobs on you and like hit pieces and things like that. I'm sure that that shit will come to me eventually you know, as my own audience and like, you know, expansion and things like that gets bigger. People will be posting crap from my past, you know, like the shit with my ex or fucking selling drugs or like, you know, being a cokehead or bashing people up or like, you know, my, me myself getting jumped. You know, guys will say that 
just make up a bunch of shit based around that or even other stuff. I actually had a good friend of mine that we were good friends for a fucking long time. Maybe like, you know, I would say that we were friends for close to 10 years. And since I've come on and started talking and doing things like that, he just took me off his Instagram and didn't even say anything to me, just deleted me. And we've been knowing each other for like 10 years. But some people like you, you're gonna lose people if you wanna be public. You know, if you wanna talk about things and you know, get attention and things like that, that makes people uncomfortable. Sometimes when I tell my story, I'll check the comments and I can see that people are uncomfortable about it. <laughs> me talking about myself makes people uncomfortable. It makes people insecure because they themselves don't have any accomplishments, but they also don't have the balls to jump on and talk about their defeats or their losses or like, you know, be like candid because that's hard. It's a lot easier to talk about the fucking wins and, you know, make out that you're Superman or Terminator or something like that. It's a lot harder to talk about like the real shit that we all take fucking losses. You know, I posted a, a post maybe about a week ago or something. And I said, if a man can be as candid about his losses as he can about his wins, then he has my respect. And I posted a photo of me getting my fucking eye socket smashed when I was like 20, 21. I'd blown out orbital, got the shit bashed out of me. And then I posted my fucking fight and knocked the guy out in 20 seconds. You know, it's, but that's like, you know, that's two sides of the same coin. That's the duality of man. There is no fucking winner. Like there is no just constant winner. It's just that they're, they're taking losses as well, but they're just only publishing the wins. And that's, I think, damaging for guys because they think that if they lose, that they're a loser. And that doesn't really mean that they're a loser. You know, we've all taken losses before. Like there's no perfect record or someone who just runs through and they're always winning. Like even Floyd Mayweather would have lost in training. You know, he's got a perfect record, but he still would have taken losses in fucking like, you know, getting to where he was at. I don't think, I think when he fought for the medal, I think he got silver when he thought fought in the Olympics and then he quit like the amateur sort of thing. So he didn't win that. But I'm sure in training and sparring and things like that, he's been rattled before because that's just the game. And I got another one. What's your plan for the housing recession that's going to happen within one to five years? See, I don't know why like you're so confident there's a housing recession coming because a lot of people are reading like a lot of crap, like boomer shit zero hedge and a bunch of crap like garbage I, i'm the man on the ground like i own fucking a bunch of houses i know that housing like it, it's a very scarce asset and it provides a good yield you know it's it's going to be the funds and that own all the fucking housing oh funds corpos and you know things like that own all of the housing it's not eventually like own nothing be happy you'll be renting you'll be on a lease if you fuck around you won't be able to lease a house. Like you'll be living in the gutter. It's pretty obvious that it's a massive control point for people. So that's part of why the prices continue to go up. You know, if you own the house that the people have to live in, they have to essentially play by your rules. You know, with social credit and things like that that are inevitably to come, you won't be able to get a place if you're like a fuck up or too controversial. So no, I don't believe that there's a housing recession coming in the next one to five years. Do I think houses like in the big cities can fall like 20%? Yes. But do I ever think that they're gonna fall like 50 or 80%? No, because imagine what the yield would be on the rents. Like rents don't necessarily fall. And for the most part, don't actually fall. House prices can drop, but rents usually stay pretty much the same, which means that as the house prices drop, the yield gets more impressive. You know, the house price might be 500K. It's generating like, you know, a 5% yield, and when you rent it out and then it falls to 400K and maybe the yield now is like 7%. So of course there is a price point where the funds or like, you know, large investors or guys like me are like, yeah, well, of course, I'm happy to lock in six and a half or 7%. Why the fuck would I not buy it? So people don't understand that there's like, you know, an artificial floor on housing. And they also don't understand that rates, like they're not gonna go up to like 10%. You know, the rate hikes are almost done. That people don't understand this is going to be another decade of dollar destruction. Like a lot of noobs don't fucking get shit. Like they don't understand that it's essentially to dump as much cash to buy assets. Like it's a Ponzi scheme. Like they've created cash to buy all the assets and people just work for it. So it's people don't understand shit. It's like Monopoly. Like the pleb is the guy running around the board just trying to hold as much cash as he can. <laughs> the, and then the fucking like funds and the fucking like corpos and things like that buy all of the actual assets. 
So the pleb has a bunch of cash from like the first five goes around. And then the, he's like, the corpos don't have a lot of cash. Like they have to put all their cash into the assets. But then over the next like 20 spins, the pleb is broke. Like he's lost everything because his cash didn't do shit for him. They, he's paying all the rents and all this crap. Like he's having to pay money every time he lands and moves on the board. It's much of what's happening in the thing. My monopoly reference is obviously the ultimate fucking reference for capitalism. You know, instead of the, so you're playing monopoly and instead of one person owns everything, they've just like their corpos and tons and things like that have just shook hands so that they'll just let the pleb keep running around the board and getting in further and further debt to keep him on the board instead of like, you know, what kicking him off because he's broke. They just put them in debt, that's the generational debt. They birth someone and they're like, this is how much money we can get off them. So it's it's pretty pretty simple to me. You know, they've leveraged citizens, like pretty much future, to keep printing more money. So no, I am not bearish on the housing fucking recession or something, certainly not in big cities. If you're out in the middle of bumfuck or you're in a dying area or something like that, then yes, I think that, you know, you could face further downside. But if you're buying smart, then I don't think you're gonna see some super recession. It's just house prices in general, as a rule, they go slow, like slowly creep up, and then they stay stagnant for a few years, and then they kind of boom up, and then they're stagnant for a few years more, and then boom, it's just the way that it goes. Like after the virus, that's much of what happened. But there's always something. See, someone will turn around and be like, oh, was this why they went up because of this, and they went up because of this? They're just trending up. You know, it's just, that's the game. Like, oh, the player below nothing and be happy. A few generations from now, if you own a house, that, that won't really be a thing. Like the plebs are gonna own less and less. Like it's pretty fucking obvious to me. I know it's obvious to me, but like uh, it's sometimes I wonder people just have blinkers on like their whole life. They don't understand what's happening. Like you, you wanna own infrastructure and assets and things like that. Like it's pretty obvious. I mean, land's so scarce. It's like what one of the scarcest assets, if not in the whole fucking world. Like there's only so much land, especially in the major cities and things like that. Like it's pretty obviously a good investment. Stuff to me is that people like get bamboozled by or something is just continually stuns me. Like it's <laughs> so obvious that it's a good investment. Like Bitcoin as well. You'll see some midwit go into some fucking six hour rant for how it's doomed to fail or how it's a bad investment. or And it's just so obviously a good investment. Like it's mathematically fixed. It's moving into a tech world. We're moving into an AI world. It could eventually be like a, some sort of product in that sort of thing. It just baffles my mind how people are just so far behind. You know, people don't understand like the brick and mortar guy. That's all old. Like, that's all a dying field. Everything is digital. Everything's going to be digital in the future. People will consume digital products. That'll be a massive thing. People are going to own less, not more. They're going to have less space. They're going to own less and they're going to be happy. Like, it's pretty obvious. They lay out the very foundation that they're gonna use and people are still like, uh, but what about the housing recession? As if there would be a fucking massive housing recession where they let plebs enter. Like the biggest thing is that they just price them out, of course, because they have all the money. The funds and that, have pension funds and things like that, rates and things like that, they can just purchase a bunch of houses and just lock them up off the market like they don't need to sell. Like why would they ever fucking sell? They don't need to. They can just leverage the house and get another house. Like that's the best thing with housing, like real estate. You don't have to sell and it essentially locks the house up because the person doesn't need to sell to get access to the majority of the money to buy another house. So it's locked a house off the market. Like that's not for sale. It's not an asset like gold where you have to sell gold to buy something else. You know, I know people can get loans on gold, but it's not as easy. It's a bit more difficult. You still have to give over physical fucking like custody and things like that. Whereas the other person can rent their house out, things like that, they can leverage it to make money on it. Like there's multiple ways, especially if it's not like single income, if it's like, you know, a multi-purpose facility or commercial or things like that, there's a lot of things you can do with the real estate. And there's a lot of tax advantages. And, you know, in Australia, there's lots of like negative gearing and things like that strategies you can use. Australian property market's one of the worst in the world. I know a lot of guys where they're plumber or an electrician again, they might be on like 100, 120K a year. And to even buy a house is extremely difficult for them. You know, buy a house within like 30 minutes of a major city because the housing market there is wild, especially now the rates are high. Because as the rates go higher, it's hard, you need more money down and it's hard for the average pleb to save. 
like it's very hard to save a house deposit to put like 20% down or something like that. It's a lot harder. You know, they kind of got a ceiling for the income and especially if they themselves have to rent, like you have to rent. So a good piece of your wage is gone and then they have to try to qualify for a loan. Like they can be saving and especially, so they're essentially saving, but then if they're saving and the house prices keep going up every like year or two, it's very hard to save. Like let's say you're saving a 100K deposit for a 500K house and then you're saving like 25K a year. But then the house price is going up 5% a year. That's your 25K, like that's done. Like you need more now. So of course I understand everything at a deep level, but the average person only really understands shit at a very surface level, like a fucking zero hedge tier surface level. So that's the game. Are you against weed and alcohol consumption? Depends if it's in moderation, you know, I'm not a big bong head. I don't fucking really smoke weed. I mean, I've probably smoked it twice in 10 years, like the last 10 years or more. You know, I don't really think that it's a good thing. I think it's pretty much a loser's drug. You know, I know that guys take it if they have PTSD and anxiety and things like that and get prescribed it. But as a rule, I still think it's kind of a loser's drug. You know, it's if the alternative is that you're a fucking schizo or something, or you've got PTSD so bad that you need it, otherwise you'll blow your brains out or your anxiety is just a mess and you're already like 50 years old, then I can understand taking shit like that. But alcohol itself, it's just a multiplier. Like it's something I take to have fun. You know, everything I do is for a purpose. I don't just like drink at home. Like if I'm doing nothing, I don't just sit around and be like, oh, I've earned this, I'm gonna have a six pack. Cause that's crap. Like that's just doesn't make sense. You know, sitting around smoking weed and things like that. It's a quick track, like I've said, to lose it. Like it's going to take you fucking nowhere in life. There's nothing that's really, it's really going to help unless you have some massive fucking issue, like a mental problem. And then you have to wonder if it's going to multiply that. You know, if you have bad anxiety or something, I think that they have a medical weed that they recommend. But I'm pretty against it. But if you can control it where maybe you like smoke a blunt like once a week or you know, you have like, maybe you limit yourself to like 10 drinks a week. I can understand that. Or whatever the fuck you're doing and it doesn't affect you. Like it doesn't affect your family. It doesn't affect your earning. It doesn't like slow you down at all. Then I can understand that. I'm in Poland. A lot of the Polish people drink like a lot. A lot of Polish guys, I would say, drink pretty much every day. Like I would say close to half or maybe close to half the population drink a lot here. And for the most part, they're still functional. You know, so if that's you, my mum's Macedonian and they drink a lot too, and they're still functional. So if that's you and you can do that, then okay. But for the most part, it's not you. It's going to be a fucking like just all the downside, especially if you do it a lot. So alcohol, it's a magnifier. You know, I go out if I want to use it and have more fun, be more relaxed and social. Weed, I don't know, unless I had some massive anxiety condition, I have PTSD and I don't smoke weed because I think it's a loser's drug. Like I don't know anyone that smokes it and they're like, oh, I'm just so great for productivity. You know, so I, I don't really like that. Got a question here. How do I get past my fear of speaking on camera? I feel like I get an imposter syndrome. It's a good question. I think that when I first turned on the camera, I don't think that I had a fear of speaking, but I wasn't as smooth as I am now. And that's not to say that I'm perfect now. Like I still know that I myself am not. The, if someone had told me like seven or eight years ago when, when I was fucking sitting in jail that I would be out doing public speaking and doing a YouTube or something like that, I would have said they're crazy. I didn't even know what YouTube was then. I didn't fucking even know that people got on camera and talk. I would have thought that was like pretty dumb, but I know that it helps guys now. You know, I know that it can multiply my voice so that I can, instead of talk to a smaller group, I can talk to a fucking ton of people. And I get messages every day now from guys being like, I appreciate you. this, this has helped me, you know, this is, can you help me with this? Or asking more questions, things like that. I enjoy it. You know, I walk around Poland, I get stopped at least, I would say every second day, someone will stop me and be like, I've seen you on TikTok, I've seen you on YouTube, I follow you and say something, you know, a compliment or something like that. Like, oh, go enjoy your stuff. And I like that, you know, it's good to be recognized, but it's also good to see the guys on the ground you know, guys on the ground that are actually getting value and benefiting and pushing it through their life, you know, improving what they can. So yeah, I enjoy it. 
But for your thing, I feel like you get an imposter syndrome. I would say that you don't believe in the message that you're giving out. If it's an imposter syndrome for you to get on and talk about yourself. Like, are you congruent with the message that you're pushing out there? Are you, have you caught up to who you're saying that you are? You know, I'm very against guys LARPing, but I understand for guys, if they're talking as though they're like one rung above they are, I can understand that. But if you're fucking like, you know, down here and you're talking like you're the man, which is what a lot of these fucking dorks do on these channels, then I think that that can be an imposter syndrome because you're not congruent with who you are. It's like you're having to send out a facade and it's hard to keep that up. So my message, my thing for you would just be to be congruent with who you are. Believe that you have value to add. Like, you know, do you believe in your message? Like, are you a good messenger? I think that it's like sales. If you don't believe in your product and you fucking like, you know, selling vacuums, but you know the vacuums are defective, like it's going to be pretty hard to sell them because you're going to eventually, it's going to start to come across that you're like, my product sucks. I'm having to fool people to try and get people to buy it. And that's kind of crippling, like over the long term, unless you're a fucking sociopath or something, it's going to be difficult to keep being able to push that message out. But as a rule, I would say it's practice. I think that if you're passionate about it and you're like actually have value to add, you're not just screaming into the fucking void, then I think that you should definitely get on camera and talk. I think that it's just something that's practice. And I think that you can become good at it. It looks like you're a fitness guy. So obviously you've got that under control. So the rest of it is just internal. If you feel like an imposter when you talk, you just have to be congruent to who you are and also believe in your message and believe that you are a messenger that can, you know, has receipts in that field to talk. See a lot of these guys, you know, these like, I hate to beat them up all the time, but these red pill nerds, They'll jump on and shit on women and say, oh, women are trash. And like, you know, that every girl's a hoe and all this crap. And like, you know, what's the shit that they say? A pergamy and all this crap. Like it's, everything's, you know, as though women don't want the best deal. Like that's pretty fucking normal. Like everyone does. But a lot of the guys in that field, they have no receipts. Like they're teaching guys to get women, but they have no women. <laughs> it's fucking insane. You know, and then they do like, even some of them do like, videos cold approaching and stuff like that and it's like autistic like it's really fucking weird it doesn't look smooth at all and it's yeah very odd i see it here near my apartment a lot of these pua fucking dorks i'm yet to meet one that's not a fucking geek and they're just spam approach women the place near me where i'd like to just go and myself be able to talk to women I can't because there's a lot of foreigners that just run through there and just talk to fucking everything. And now if I was to talk to one, I look like that weirdo, like sitting in a group of guys and then just spam approaching girls. And some of them film it and stuff, like filming and interactions, fucking gay. Like it's a very big invasion of privacy. Another one, what is my weight? My weight now, my weight for my flight was 85. My weight now, when I get back to Poland, I just seem to eat nonstop. So now I'm up to 90 but I want to be down to 86, 87. So I need to get back on the, I've been eating breakfast more and that's been a fucking mistake. I've been eating breakfast cause yeah, the schedule has been a bit wild, but I'm moving down to only eating the afternoon again. So that's going to be a, a big thing. I want to get my weight down another four or five kilos back to 86, maybe 87. Oh Jesus. How did my life look like when I was 14? Well, my life when I was 14 was pretty shit. I remember that I was still playing video games. I played Counter-Strike. I wasn't a professional then, but I was pretty fucking good. Yeah, what have been playing Counter-Strike then, I would say. I used to play Counter-Strike in Tribes 1 back in the day. I was very good at both. But I went to eight schools during that time, like during my fucking, those years, like as a kid, moved constantly. My dad was sick. So my life was fucking trash. Like I remember that I was hated school. I had really bad psoriasis. I used to get fucking sores from here to here. My skull would just be on fire. Like when I went out in public, the weather in Victoria is fucking shit as well. So I used to fuck it up and it all spaz out. And my family, like we didn't have a lot of money to get that sort of stuff well looked into. And yeah, my life, it sucked. You know, I remember thinking that I was a pretty unhappy kid. 
I just used to escape into video games. Yeah, I didn't really have any success with women or things like that. You know, I didn't even have my first kiss till I was like 20 years old. I was already like a oh, fucking old late bloomer. Like I missed all of that. I was just on the computer, you know, so yeah, my life essentially was a, a zero at that point. But I don't regret it, you know. I look back at some of those memories as a kid very fondly. You know, a lot of the stuff that I learned as a kid. I remember around that age, I used to get the bus home and I would just get bullied the whole time. Guys would like stir the dandruff up in my hair and then tease me about it for fucking like again and again and again. I remember sometimes I would just go to school and then just walk home. And it was like a three hour walk or more back to my house, like where, where I lived. And sometimes if I knew my parents were home, I would just sit in the garage on my own in the dark for like, until school finished. Sometimes I would walk home and then sit in the dark for like five or six hours and just think about like, if life was always gonna be like that, like if I was always just gonna get picked on every fucking day. Cause I remember then I didn't really have any friends. You know, it was always like, I was the one out guy. So I went to so many schools and things like that, that it's, I was just always the new kid. You know, I didn't really have any allies or like, you know, any alliances, but I also didn't really know what to do. I didn't really know how to defend myself. I was scared of conflict. I was someone who was like trying to solve the problem. Like, you know, talk my way out of shit, but I would always end up in trouble because people would be like, this guy's a fucking pussy. <laughs> when you're a pussy, like people think that like the, the approach of the fucking tard, he thinks that if you're weak and you know, you're no threat and things like that, that you get left alone. And that's not the case. Cause I know that like in school, I was weak and the quiet guy and I got it fucking way worse. In prison, the quiet guys get wrecked. <laughs> They're the ones that shit happens to. It's not the bombastic fucking guy that's out there that, you know, gets raped. He might get fucking bashed and shanked and shit like that, but he'll never get raped. It's the one who's the quiet one, who's the one who's zero threat. Like he's the one that people won't understand how badly it's gotten for him. Like that he's going back to his cell and his cellmates raping him every night. Like it's completely different. You don't want to be a passive guy because there are places where you can't get away. And you can't talk your way out of shit. Being passive is fucking dangerous, especially as a man. I only answered that because I know the next question. What happened to the 18 year old who got raped in jail in the story you told? I actually saw two good dudes get raped. I saw one guy get raped and then I heard another guy get raped beside me in the cell that we're in. And he eventually got kicked out of the unit because he woke up in the morning and the guards saw that he had hickeys and like bite marks on his neck. So they're like, you gotta go, like something's happening here. But that was like fucking two weeks or something after it initially happened. I don't know what happened to him. I would assume that he got moved into protection. I, I don't know if he would have agreed to it or not, but they probably moved him into protection. He was just a kid. I think that if you've been like raped and bitten and shit like that, like they're gonna push you to go to a protective unit, despite him not actually probably being a dog, he would still get moved to protection. I don't know what happened to him. I would like to think that he got his shit sorted out, but I doubt it. You know, rapes and things like that, they're very underreported in prison, like sexual assaults and stuff like that. It's not something that gets documented or really reported because you have to snitch. Like if the person got raped, they would have to snitch and they're still probably serving a sentence. Like, do you really think the police are gonna come down and wanna like take statements from prisoners about other prisoners? Like how, how is that even really possible to do? The person would have to snitch which would be tons more work for the guards because now they have to get the police in to take statements. Like they're not police, they're just correct. The correction officers run it. So now they'd have to get police down to investigate. And then who the fuck are they gonna ask? Like the guy's eyewitness statement. It, there's no rape kit. It's very, very unlikely that they would get any sort of fucking like, you know, it's just his word against the other guys. Cause no one's gonna be like, yeah, I heard it or anything like that. So it's very unlikely that there was any justice done. So yeah, it's the thing that people don't really understand with prison. And that's the thing that people don't really understand with life. You know, it's having boundaries and you know, things that people can't cross and lines and things like that. It doesn't mean not getting raped in jail because obviously not all of you will go to prison. I mean, most of you won't, but that doesn't mean that you can't still be like shit on in real life. And when you have kids, you won't be able to teach them boundaries. You won't be able to teach them like how to act and, and the lines that people can't cross and how to hold themselves. When you have boundaries, you fight less. Like there's so much less fighting. 
Like, no, I, I don't know the last time I got in a fist fight other than at the boxing gym. Like, it's not really a thing because people know that there's it's going to be a big fucking fight. You know, it's not something that the people that they challenge are the, are the people that they know they can test and run over and things like that. I'm around very tough people and I've never, like, it's not really a thing that happens that you get challenged. So again, boundaries is a massive thing for guys. I pushed it probably a zillion times. I would say I'm probably the guy on YouTube that's pushed it the hardest. And I noticed some other guys saying about it now, but it's a massive thing. Boundaries is just part of your frame. Like it's part of the fucking like your space, like the fence around you. It's, you know, it's like your bubble, just enforcing your bubble, you know, and then enforcing it on other people. Like you respect theirs as well. It's part of being a man. Hey brother, what advice would you give a 23 year old carpenter, no real friends and a stoner? At least you're honest about where you stand. You're still 23, so you're quite young. Well, first off, I would give you at least some congratulations that you've gone through the trade to become a carpenter. I think it's a respectable field. I think that you're obviously like, you know, good with your hands and you must still be able to work like fairly hard despite being a stoner. I think that you know that the weed's a problem. You know, it's being a stoner. It's a cool way of saying that it's pissing away your potential. You know, it's it's like a, a distraction as well. Like I would assume that having no friends is fucking difficult because I've had the times with no friends. I know that it's very, as a man, they don't address that you can be very lonely. Like it's, it's not like pussy to say that you get lonely as a guy. Like we're not meant to be robots that are completely alone, like some fucking Rambo. That's not a thing. Like for guys, that's what they try to push to us. That you shouldn't need anyone. You should just be strong and stoic and don't worry about anything. And that's not true. Like everyone needs a tribe and a community and things like that. There's one organization that I recommend and like, you know, a lot of you will understand what I'm talking about. It's a great group for men, but it's where I met Jewel. But for you, I think the weed's gonna be the first thing that you need to slow down. The first thing that's gonna go you have to be in that discomfort. Like you, I can't tell you that it's gonna be easy to be on your own. When you're dropping the weed too, it's gonna to be tough, but you need that. You need to see how bad it's gotten, like with no weed, because then you'll have no distractions. Like you'll be bathing in the discomfort and that's gonna be the one that motivates you to get out there. You know, you have to motivate to push out to make new friends. You know, I'm not gonna guess why you don't have friends. I mean, imagine you probably stoning very hard like being a, a bong head and it's hard to really interact with people but like you're a trader you should be around guys and things like that quite often so you should just you know it all starts with one friend and it's all practiced like it's all becoming a friend and a brother and things like that it's learned behavior you have to practice it you have to train to be a friend like it's practice that it doesn't just happen overnight that you're a good friend like you have to learn to put people, other people's needs above yourself. Like when you're a part of a brotherhood and things like that at times, and you have to learn all of that thing. And that's going to be something that you learn off the weed, like that discomfort and being uncomfortable and things like that, that should give you the inspiration to branch out. When do you think the next bull run will be? <laughs> that's a good question. I think that obviously the halvings in March, I think it's about nine and a half months away. So I do think that the next bull run, I think we'll be looking very good at the end of next year. I think the market will be looking quite good. I do think that Bitcoin will have a higher dominance this time. I think that currencies and things like that, like, you know, Litecoin and Bitcoin and Bcash even to a degree and things like that will have a higher market share than they did currently, like they did in the past. I think the old season will still happen. It always does, but it'll be a different type of fucking run. I think that they'll have a basket of like the top five or top 10 altcoins that go into an ETF at scale. Like they go into an ETF for normies as well. So I think that they'll get a lot more liquidity and they'll get more like of a bid and they'll eventually get more of the market share. And then there'll still be shit coins and things like that. But some of them won't have another cycle. And you just have to look at the last cycle. Some still didn't break their all time high. So bag holding meme tokens and stuff like that. That's a problem. But yes, the next bull run to me will be the end of next year. It'll be starting to look quite good, the market. Best piece of advice for a young apprentice plumber who earns 2,400 a month. 
first off, it's the same as the other tradie carpenter. I think it's good that you're seeing through being a plumber. I think that it's a good job and I think that it's a very needed thing. I think it's good for your discipline that you're still pushing through the apprenticeship. I think that obviously you're earning, what, so 600 a week. Obviously you don't have a lot of money. You know, you pay all your outgoings and things like that. I assume that you have kind of fuck all. But I think that it's just about pushing through like your apprenticeship. You know, I don't know how easy it is for you. It might be easy. Uh, you might not need to focus so much on the studies and like things like that. Like you might just be able to breeze through it. But if you have to focus a lot, I would just be focusing on getting through that apprenticeship. But if you do have the time and the like, you know, mental capacity and that too, to learn another skill, you know, like sales marketing or something like that, cause you can eventually have your own team and you're on your own fucking gig and that might be in plumbing and you can run your own shop or something like that or like van where they go out and do it all the shit themselves to keep more of the margins but they have to learn sales marketing and all of that stuff as well so if you could learn that that would be a good good thing i would think there's a lot of courses like you know in the real world run by tate that teaches sales and marketing i think that that's a good thing to learn that i know the guy who does the sales and another guy who does the marketing but the professors there they're both quite good so I think that's one avenue to learn down. I think it's like 50 bucks a month. So that's not a lot of money. I don't imagine that really anyone would notice that if they're working. So I think that it's very good for that price point. So the real world by Tate, I think it's, it's great for that. Learning an extra skill. And yeah, I would just be pushing through that plumber, like the apprenticeship, so that then you get paid more. And I would also be focusing on your body, your fitness, all of those things as well. But learning sales and marketing will help you and yeah, I think that it's good that you're pushing through, you know, just keep doing that work on your body, work on your fitness, work on your, still talk to women and things like that, like work on your social calibration, it's important. But yeah, it sounds like you're on the right track. If you have extra money left over and you wanna practice investing, I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't know how much money you could possibly have on that sort of a wage, but maybe you probably put like a few hundred dollars a month into the market just to practice like to learn how to invest and learn about the process of like, you know, opening exchange account investing and moving money around and crypto around and things like that. Like you learn that. So then as your like income goes higher, you already know. And then eventually you're on like, you know, eight or 10K a month. And then you've learned it now. So you can still put that percentage of your wage in every month. And now it's starting to matter because you're still a young man. By the time you're 30, like you can be in a brilliant position. So that's my one on that one. If I was 25 again, what would be the steps to get back into the position I am at now? When I was 25, I was selling, I was in the army. I was almost selling dope, I think at that point. But my position is to get back to where I am now. I would just learn the same, it's just the same thing. I would learn a high income skill that can be scaled online. Obviously, if I knew what I knew now, I would never have had to go down the dope route. Like I only did that because I didn't really know a lot of stuff. But I knew that was a sure way to make money because I knew people that were making massive money in that field. Like I knew people doing massive importations and stuff like that. So I knew guys making real money, but that was one of the fields that I only could do myself. I know guys now where they make more money than I could have ever made in that field just on an online gig. They sell courses or they sell advice or you know they're trading or they're, you know, some guys doing like NFTs, all sorts of shit. Guys running like, you know, OnlyFans models, things like that, like running consultancy agencies for them where they manage the girls all legitimately, like no, no bullshit. But yeah, there's, there's so many fields that you can earn money in, but to me, the best one's going to be online. You know, you can start with a basic sort of like a bare bones skill to have behind you. Like the guy with the plumbing is brilliant because he'll, once he's finished that, he'll never be broke. Like he can go anywhere in the world and he'll always be doing okay. Like at least he always has a skill that he can monetize at well. You know, a lot of guys don't realize how they're not really that far off being under the bridge. You know, they don't have the, like they don't have a position where they can stand back and be like, you know, I'll never be homeless because I have a skill that can always make, you know, pretty good money. I would work on that. But my, yeah, I would find an industry, a vehicle that can scale to online and then I would probably try to learn it or master it and then I would teach it. That's probably what I would do now if I could go back into those days. I mean, I probably wouldn't have had to do the prison and all of that stuff, but I wouldn't change it for me. You know, I, I wouldn't change any part of my life or anything that I've done in my life because it's all brought me to here. 
and that's why I can teach. Hey, why do you pick Warsaw and Poland as your main place? I pick Warsaw because I like the Polish people. I like, think the Polish people are very good. They're quite based. I think that they keep a lot of that fucking propaganda and crap out of the country. You know, a lot of the wokeism stuff, it's still here to a degree, but it's under control. It's not like fucking running through the mind virus or whatever, however you want to call it. They're like, you know, corporate agendas and stuff. They're not pushed as heavily here. People are quite peaceful and relaxed and it's quite safe, but it's also not a like shithole. People have manners and you can't run around disrespecting people. People will fight you. It's, you know, it's, it can be, it's like a man's place. You know, the women are, I think, more feminine and things like that as well. Like they can be, because it's, it's not like a fucking competition and it's also not that dangerous. You know, there's not like fights and stuff like that on the street or well, it's not like London or something where you might get stabbed. You can walk around with nice shit and it's very unlikely that you would have problems unless you move into a field like crime yourself and then you would realize that there's organized shit here. It's not something that you just fly into. But yeah, I think Warsaw is a beautiful city. It's got a lot of people from all many countries here now. A lot of Ukrainians, a lot of people from like Belarus and things like that here. I just think it's great. I think it's a brilliant country. I think Warsaw is still underrated. I think that it's great here. I have a crew here. We have, you know, a group of probably eight of us here that uh, have each other's back. We're all Australians. Mike is fucking the token Australian. He's American, but we say that he's Australian because at this point he is. So yeah, it's, I have a great crew here, but if you come to Warsaw and you like, you know, don't, or it's just where you make it, you know, it's, it's not really the place. It's the people, you know, it's not the place where you are. I mean, you can be in Monaco, but if you're alone or you have a shit network, it's going to suck. And then you could be in Bali or like some fucking little shit hut. But if you have all you guys beside you, like all your brothers, it's still fun. Like you can still get shit done. It's still cool. So that's what, what it really matters. Bitcoin prediction by 2030. And what's my favorite crypto? A Bitcoin prediction by 2030. It's still, it's just a, like a bit of a bombastic call. I mean, it's eight years away, or seven years. So, you know, I don't know if it's still around. I mean, it can almost always be like changed. I mean, AI by that point, I would assume we'll be getting quite close. Maybe they can think of a better product, but you know, all things considered, I don't know, five or 600 K, something like that or more for a Bitcoin. I know it sounds crazy, but I mean, it's like pretty obvious to me as the funds move money and as more pension funds and insurances and things like that are like, people buy it and they buy it in the funds to never sell it, like the pension funds, like the average normie goes, oh, I'm just allocating X amount to Bitcoin and I'll sell it at my retirement. You know, that, that can be like 30 or 40 years down the pipe, so it locks it up. And my favorite crypto is Ethereum. I'm a big believer in Vitalik. And I'm a big believer that, you know, obviously they can change the like token, they can change the fucking like, you know, like metrics and things like that to make it price go higher, like they're all incentivized. So adding the deflationary and things like that for Ethereum, it's all part of the price going higher. And I'm bullish on it. I also think that it'll be a censored chain though. Like I think that it'll have to be compliant, obviously, because the Ethereum foundation's an attack vector. But I think that even Bitcoin will end up like that anyway. They'll just censor certain wallets and maybe even be able to censor countries eventually. So they won't pick up the mining from that. But <clears throat> it's a story for another day. All right, lads, I think we've covered the fucking bulk of the questions. Actually, there was one specific question that a friend of mine got DM that I wanted to answer. What was it? <clears throat> yeah, one question that actually resonated with me. I remember it off the top of my head. One guy said, uh, I want to get a hand tattoo, but I'm afraid of being judged by people that I work with. Like, I'm afraid that they'll make fun of me. And I think that you get one life. Like you only have one life through this world, you know what I mean? And if you really believe in it, if you're certain that you want this tattoo, you know, if you, it can be a sign of you just doing what you want. You know, it's a sign of like, you put your balls on the line and be like, I wanted to get that, so I did it. It's a sign of like, you know, stepping into being a man. But if it's something that you're not that convinced on, or you think that you're gonna regret it in a month's time or a few months time, you should not get it. But if it's something that you've thought about for a long time and you know, it's something that you really want, I think that it can be your stand, like putting a fucking like flag in the ground and being like, I did what I wanted to do. 
even though now there might be consequences where people are like, I can't believe you got that tattoo. But that's part of it as a man. Like that's part of the fucking life. But if you want it, I think that it's your body and you should be able to do it. You know, guys will say shit like my tattoos, they're not for everyone, but I didn't get them for anyone else. I got them for myself. Like every tattoo that I have tells a story, you know, and, and I like to be able to look at it. You know, I've had friends that have died or like, you know, a guy murdered, like an acquaintance murdered and all of these tattoos mean something to me. You know, I can look at them and remember good times and hard times and things like that. It's nothing's just a random tattoo on me. So it's all part of the story. And people turn around and say, oh, what about when you're older or whatever? Like, you know, will you regret it? I've, there's so many other things to think about, you know, I'll already be fucking old. I don't really think that I'll regret any of that shit. And I'm not, I know that I won't leave like a pristine corpse. You know, that's never been my goal to get to the end of life perfectly fucking restored or something like we all go to the same end. It doesn't really matter if you arrive pristine or you arrive with like fucking a wooden leg or whatever, like it doesn't matter. You just, this is just like a vehicle. Like your body is just a vehicle. Like this is just, People don't understand that. Like this is like a middle ground. You're just in a vehicle that gets around. It's not like fucking everything. So yes, I think that if you want to get the tattoo, I think you should do it. But you should also understand hand tattoos mean things. You know, so if you're like we're moving through corporate and things like that and you have a big hand tattoo, it could slow you down. But that's a decision for you to make. You know, I think that as a man, we have to understand the, the like consequences of our decisions but also make them calculated. You know, you understand, I do this, this is probably going to be the outcome. You know, the, the, uh, this is what I want to do, so I'm going to do it. You know, I think that as a rule, if you really feel like you should do it, I think you should. But if you have any second guesses or doubts or something like that, then the hand, it's very visible. But yeah, I would get it, but that's up to you, lad. All right, guys, it's enough for today. Till next time.